Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Did God actually say? It's a pretty big question in the Bible. What scenario does that question bring to your mind? I'll give you a hint. It's all the way back at the beginning. In the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, this is the question that the serpent, that the devil, asks Eve. And really he asks both Eve and Adam, for we know later on that Adam was standing there with her. And he asked the question, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And that's Genesis 3, verse 1. Now, of course, we know that the devil is a liar, and he twists words. So he has a little bit of truth in there, but also a lie, to go to Eve into the conversation. And then he convinces her that God didn't really say... Not only that you shouldn't eat of any tree in the garden, because he didn't actually say that, but that the tree which he told them not to eat of, he didn't really mean that either. And you know the rest of the story after that. Well, today in our gospel reading, Jesus is addressing this same sort of question that naturally now, because we have fallen into sin, arises in our own mind about the things that God asks of us. This voice that finds its origin in Satan, the deceiver. Did God really say that? Does he really mean that? And that voice continues to tempt us even today. In the gospel scriptures today, Jesus addresses the desire in each of us to chip away at his words until we're comfortable with them, until we find them manageable for ourselves. He's addressing the consequence of trying to convince ourselves that God, God didn't really mean righteousness and holiness to that degree. But we're going to hear from Jesus today that God demands nothing short of divine perfection. That Jesus doesn't come along and let us off the hook from the law, but he intensifies it. So what does that mean? Well, Jesus is going to answer the question that we failed to resist in the garden on our behalf. And he's going to help us get it right, to help us see what God really says. Before we get into the section of the Sermon on the Mount we're going to meditate on today, there's a few important things to note about the text. From the context, right, we have the context of our verses today kind of filling in from what we've learned the last two weeks, right? That Jesus is addressing his new disciples, and they are the spiritless, those who are in sorrow, and those who are powerless. Quite the bunch for the Son of God to call into service. But he says that those people who are trodden on and dismissed by the world are the blessed ones. When Jesus shows up. And due to this blessing from Jesus, they begin to hunger and thirst for a new kind of righteousness. They begin to be able to have mercy on others, for they have been shown mercy. Their hearts have begun to be purified, and so they act with pure hearts. And they've been put at peace in Jesus, and so now they are able to bring peace wherever they go. Not perfectly, of course, we all know. But a new thing is beginning in those who believe in Jesus. Then he placed a calling on those blessed ones. A calling to be that which salts the earth and that which brings light to the world. But not in order to save ourselves, but in order to give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And just before we get to the part today, Jesus emphasizes, because you hear all that and you think, that's great news, the hard part's done, I'll take the potato chips and sit on the couch now. But to address the voice that thinks it's all finished, Jesus emphasizes that he's not come to abolish the law, 
but to fulfill the law. It's not going to pass away, and you better not soften it. Not for yourself, nor teach others to do the same. After all, the only way to be righteous is to have a right relationship with God. But now Jesus is addressing those that he knows. He knows that when he says all these things, his disciples, remember those spiritless, sorrowful, powerless people, they're guilty of all the things that he's about to say. He knows that before he begins to teach. Because he wants to remove their convenient and false way out. Not in order to crush them and make them feel bad, but so that they can see their real salvation in him. And he does this not by rewriting the law, but by being the one in our stead to fulfill it. So he follows a pattern here, which you may have even picked up as we were reading the gospel today. His goal is to teach the true meaning of the Torah, the law and the prophets. And so there's a pattern that he follows here because he needs to correct the bad teaching of his day as he's getting new disciples. Because they've been hearing some stuff about the things that Jesus is going to teach about and it's not quite right. So he starts each section with a phrase that expresses this. He says, you have heard that it was said. So he knows they are hearing things about the stuff he's going to talk about. And it's always followed then by a statement from Jesus that says, But I say to you. So you've heard that it's been said about this, but I'm telling you. right? This is Jesus saying, God did really say. And then he's going to explain what God said. And Jesus here is teaching with his divine authority as the Son of God. You've been told that this is what God said, but I'm about to tell you what he really said. The answer to that question, did God actually say? And he does that by talking about the heart. It turns out, according to Jesus, that the inner and outer life are under the same judgment of God. You see, over time, listening to that voice that started all the way back into the garden, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, the teachers of the law, they had softened the law to only the exterior life, only to the outward things that they could actually accomplish and control. And Jesus is here to say, no, God really did mean more than that. And in order for us to understand this, we have a doctrine that we were uh, given by Luther from the scriptures, which is called the two kinds of righteousness. And that's going to be key to understanding this. So that it means that there's a righteousness before God. And this we call the vertical realm. So between us and God, there's a sort of righteousness that exists there. And then there's the horizontal realm, which is the righteousness that exists between us between created beings in this world. And Jesus is going to bring the vertical realm into play that has been left out. Because the Pharisees were only concerned, as he says later, with what's on the outside. They're only concerned with the horizontal realm of righteousness. And Jesus is about to tell us there's more to it than that. And it brings both sorrow and joy. So first thing he tackles is the fifth commandment, which is why we read that as part of our intro to the service today. And he starts off, you have heard that it was said, murder's bad. Outward murder is all that this is talking about. That is what they have been saying during Jesus' day. And if you hear that, you might think, all right, check, check. Have you killed anybody lately? I haven't. I'm doing good. Right? But Jesus keeps talking. And he says, But I say to you, anger in your heart, insults, 
and harsh words make you liable to the same judgment as murder. How are you doing now? Not so good. You see, Jesus is teaching that in the vertical realm, in this relationship we have with God, that the inner thoughts of anger and harsh words are the same thing as murdering. For you're murdering your brother in your heart. They're under the same judgment of sin. In the horizontal realm, of course, we know that their consequences clearly differ. If you have an angry thought about someone, they may, may never even know that you've had that thought. But if you attack them, insult them, or kill them, there's legal recourse for some of those. There's legal consequences in this life. But not just in this life isn't just the earthly stuff. There's also spiritual things going on in the horizontal realm. The shame and guilt that assail you, the ammo that Satan has against you is greater. For, as James would say, the more fully grown sin. The next topic is lust, adultery, and divorce. And again, you have heard that it was said, and he just restates, you shall not commit adultery. Again, referring specifically to the outward act of adultery and the physical act of that with another person. So if you're not doing that, if you haven't done that, check. You're good to go. Check one off the list. I'm a good person. I'm a righteous person person. And when it came to divorce, he says, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. In other words, divorce is okay under the right circumstances, and if it's handled properly, that's easy enough, particularly for the Pharisees who taught that. But I say to you, Jesus goes on, that lustful intent is adultery in the heart and is under the same judgment. Lustful intent would be fantasizing, viewing someone as a se sexual object, viewing pornography, and this is a sin of male and female. All of that is the same in the eyes of God as physical, actual adultery. Again, I thought I was doing good. I thought I was righteous, but it turns out I'm not. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual morality makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Not so easy. And even in the grounds where he permits it here, it's not a good thing. Jesus says divorce is never good. Now it's important we don't understand these passages as comprehensive case law. These aren't talking about all the particulars of the situations that are brought about by these things. You can see that in the section on lust because if you look around, nobody's missing an eye or a hand. If Jesus meant all that he was saying literally here, there'd not be a whole body in this whole gathering. But what is he teaching here? He's teaching that divorce is never good, even when permitted, and that it's a serious sin. And to illustrate the seriousness of the sin of lust and divorce, he uses hyperbole for lust, and he reminds you what's actually at risk with divorce. Lust is such a serious thing that you should be willing to remove parts of your body that cause you to think those things rather than suffer the judgment of God. Divorce is such a serious thing that by doing so, you make the other party commit adultery. And those they remarry commit adultery. So in the vertical realm, Jesus is teaching us that inner lustful desires and casual divorce are under the same judgment as adultery. 
and really that there's no such thing in the eyes of God as casual or no-fault divorce. For the teaching at the time about divorce was that a man could bring a certificate of divorce really for any matter based on a softened interpretation of the law in the Old Testament. And he could get out of his marriage. And Jesus says, that's not what marriage is about. That's not what God says about those things. And obviously with these, the horizontal realm consequences differ greatly. Actual adultery gives you grounds for divorce, even according to Jesus here. His ideal hope is that you're able to forgive and reconcile, but because of the hardness of heart, God allows it. And in our society, you do also have recourse legally in cases such as that, that lead to broken relationships, not only between husbands and wives, but between their children and the damage even goes beyond that. Inner lustful thoughts, they certainly cause spiritual turmoil and distress for those faithful disciples. But there's no legal ramifications for that. And again, somebody may not even know that you've looked at them in such a way other than God, which is what Jesus is telling us here. But divorce has legal ramifications. Adultery has consequences physically and legally in our culture. And again, the same truth applies. The more fully grown the sin, the greater spiritual duress the disciple becomes under attack in guilt and shame. Taking oaths is the next section. You have heard that it was said, don't swear falsely, but keep your oath to the Lord. And Jesus is responding to a teaching at the time of a hierarchy of oaths, right? You couldn't swear in the name of God, that was blasphemous. So they would pick things close to God, like the city of Jerusalem or the temple or heaven or the earth. And what Jesus says here is that we should not take an oath at all. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all. And in truthfulness, as Peter finds out later, when he makes an oath to stand with the, the Lord even if everyone turns against him, oaths don't actually enhance the truthfulness of our word. And so Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So in the vertical realm, he's teaching us that oaths taken and other lesser things are still under the judgment of lies and not keeping your word. And they don't actually help you keep your word. And in the horizontal realm, when you break your word to somebody, it causes damage, relationships, differing levels of consequences depending on how well you know that person and the nature of the oath that you take. And we can see this in the world everywhere. People say that they're going to say the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I know we got some lawyers in here. We're not 100% on that. And then at the end of all that, we say, this is the gospel of Christ. And we say, praise to you, O Christ. Why? So I get to the end of that, and I'm thinking, well, I'm screwed. I'm out of luck. I thought I was righteous, but it turns out I'm actually a horrible person. Jesus is the one telling me this stuff, so what is going on here? Why is Jesus saying this, and what are we now to do? Because Jesus has answered the question, did God actually say, and his answer is yes, and there go all of your hopes of ever being righteous. Well, he did that because for the disciple of Jesus, our hope for righteousness is no longer in the law. And the reason that Jesus pushes so strongly on this is so that you're left with no doubt that if that were the way, you're toast. Every single one of you. And again, he doesn't do that in order to be cool, but to point you to your salvation in him. 
right? As Paul later joyously declares that now there is a righteousness manifested apart from the law. A righteousness in Jesus Christ. So with our teaching of two kinds of righteousness, we get through this, and in the vertical realm between us and God, here's what we've got. No righteousness. All of our good works are dirty rags. No matter how hard I try, I can't do it. I have nothing to contribute in the vertical realm. I have one hope. Jesus. In the vertical realm between us and God, there's one righteousness, and that is Jesus' righteousness. And the joy of the disciple of Jesus, the reason that you're spiritless and mourning and powerless yet still blessed is because in faith he gives you his very own perfect divine righteousness. In the horizontal realm, because of Jesus now, we can begin to actually live holy lives. Before we didn't even have a choice. We were enslaved to our sin. We had no spirit. And now we've been given the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, don't choose evil, choose good. We can actually choose good because of the Holy Spirit. And we've been freed to do so because now our sense of salvation, our sense of self-worth, our worry over what is going to happen to us is no more. For all of those questions, those are all vertical realm questions, and they have found their answer their simple yes in Jesus. So when you come here and you confess your sins, the world has beaten you up, you've beaten yourself up, the devil has tempted you, and you have fallen time and time again, and you feel vile, you hear the blessed words of our Lord Jesus that your sins are forgiven on account of what he has done for you. A renewal of your spirit, a, a regeneration of this new heart that you have in Christ. And then he sends you out, not so that you can be a better person to save yourself, but so that you can do good. And why is it that he calls us to do good? So that we may glorify our Father who is in heaven. And in so doing in the presence of others, they see him. They see somebody who hasn't gotten it right but is at joy and at peace in Jesus. And so then they see Jesus in you. Because you can now be merciful. Because you now bring peace. Because Jesus lives in you. So dear friends in Christ, you have been redeemed fully and completely and made into something new the blessed ones, the disciples of Jesus, formerly dead in our sins, spiritless, powerless, and in sorrow and mourning, and now we have the Holy Spirit, joy and peace. Your salvation is one. The kingdom of heaven is yours. Now go in faith and gladly do what he commands. In the name of Jesus.